It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, dig into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my very special guest is Brian Simmons, and we're going to be discussing the book of Isaiah from the Passion Translation. Brian, it is always an honor to speak with you, my friend. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, Sean. Love being with you, bro. Well, I, I've just, I, you know, ever since our first conversation, I've been eager to find some excuse to bring you back. So here we are. Uh, before we get to Isaiah, though, I want to have you give us an update. You're still working on the Old Testament. You're in the midst of translating. So give us kind of that in the moment passion translation update. What are you working on right now? Awesome. Well, I am working on the book of Jeremiah, and I hope to finish within about two weeks. And uh, Jeremiah has been amazing journey. You know, he's the prophet of righteousness. He just thundered a message with tears and with passion. He was such a passionate prophet. And then after Jeremiah, I'll jump right into Lamentations. That's uh, four chapters of, uh, you know, it's got some beautiful scriptures in there. Great is his faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. That hymn came out of the book of Lamentations. And then uh, later on this year, I will have started Ezekiel. And by this time next year, I hope to have Ezekiel and Daniel compiled together in one volume and released with Broad Street. Well, Brian, thank you so much for that update. One of the things I was thinking about as I was getting ready for the interview is, you know, you've gone through this whole journey of translating the New Testament. Now you're in the midst of translating the Old Testament. Uh, I'm curious, you know, if you have to contrast the two experiences were there any unique challenges or surprises that you've encountered moving now into the Old Testament? Anything that was different for you? Yes, there is. The Hebrew, of course, Hebrew and Greek both, Koine Greek and Biblical Hebrew are both dead languages. So we are studying a, a, a dead language. What we mean by that is nobody's speaking it today. Greek on, in the uh, nation of Greece is not Koine Greek. And the Hebrew spoken in Israel, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, that is not biblical Hebrew. So it's a totally different animal to analyze the New Testament and the Old Testament. Uh, Greek, I compare it to bricks, that you build your thought one brick at a time, and you're just, you keep adding bricks. There's one one sentence in the Greek text that goes for 12 verses in Ephesians 1. Uh, chapter three, uh, chapter uh, one, verse three to 12, uh, three to, to uh, 13. And nobody talks that way in Greek, where Hebrew, one sentence, one word in Hebrew is like a sentence because Hebrew is so nuanced. It's flavorful. It is passionate. And I love doing the Old Testament. There's, it's descriptive. If Greek is bricks, uh, Hebrew is a brush stroke, and it, it releases something on the canvas, every single word in the Hebrew text, the Hebrew Bible. So I'm loving doing the Old Testament. I find it uh, exquisite, poetic, full of passion and emotion. Uh, Greek is the language of the scholar, the language of the engineer, of the, the brilliant uh, precision English is somewhat like that. It's a very precise language. Hebrew is not a precise language. You know, you, you know, there's not really a past tense and a future tense in Hebrew. So it's like you got to decipher it. It is a, a matrix. It's a code. And I find it delightful. And we need lots of translations of the Hebrew Bible, lots of them, because one Hebrew word can mean a whole lot of different things. Well, uh, I want to get in a moment, Brian, into kind of what are those top two or three things that you learned as you work through the book of Isaiah. But uh, one thing I want to have you answer first is, like, what were some of your preconceived notions or thoughts as you headed into the project? Obviously, you had some level of exposure to having worked with and read the book of Isaiah through the years. So when you were on on the beginning, the front starting line of this, uh, what were you thinking? What were you expecting? Well, I began with a miss. Uh, apprehension, a misunderstanding, I really thought Isaiah was this austere, stern, iconic, 
uh, granite-like marble statue that just thundered out his prophecies with very little emotion. But I got to know the prophet Isaiah. So the biggest, you know, alignment that I had to make in my heart is to understand the man himself. Isaiah was a, he was the Paul of the Old Testament. He was a genius. He was, his work is a masterpiece. He uh, was royalty. He was the nephew of King Uzziah. So he had, he had liberty in the palace. He was a known figure. He was uh, quite loving and compassionate. He was married to a prophetess. He had two sons. So he, we get a glimpse into the heart of Isaiah himself. He was a family man. And wow, he, he had to do all kinds of things like walk around with a billboard with, with a sign, a Meher Shalal Hazbaz, which means quick to the pl- plunder, swift to the spoil, that uh, the Assyrians are going to come and invade the land. So he was warning the people, King Ahaz, et cetera, about the coming invasion. But ultimately, he prophesied victory. He prophesied deliverance. And the Assyrians, as you know, 185,000 of them were killed one night because the angel of the Lord came. That's during the book of Isaiah. He prophesied through the reigns of five kings, probably the longest Uh, lasting ministry of any prophet over 50 years of prophetic ministry. Uh, Quite a man. And that that was the biggest uh, thing I had to let go of, that I saw him as a person that actually saw the Lord in the throne room, high and lifted up. He had divine encounters, but he was a loving, powerful voice of comfort to Israel. Well, next, Brian, I would love for you to bring us into those surprises, those big discoveries. Take us through some of the most magnificent things you encountered while working through the book of Isaiah. Well, I think, uh, without a doubt, the apex of the book is chapter 53. Isaiah 53 is the most beautiful description of the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, One scholar has said every single verse of that chapter is alluded to and fulfilled on the day Jesus Christ was crucified in the New Testament. So it just think 700 years before crucifixion was even invented as a form of execution by the Romans, 700 years earlier, Isaiah is like standing at the foot of the cross through a portal of time, fast forwarded 700 years into the future, and he sees Yeshua, the Messiah, pierced his hands and his feet, and quotes the very words that Jesus was to speak on the cross. Just phenomenal that he was, you know, buried among the rich, crucified among criminals, but buried in a rich man's tomb. And all of those, you know, who has believed this report of the Lord, disfigured, marred, beaten like no other man, Nobody wanted him. We turned our faces from him and hid in disgust. But yet he is the one that brings the light of salvation. So maybe you can tell chapter 53 rang my chime and I wept. Believe me, when you read in Isaiah, you read chapter 53, you're going to see my tear stains on that chapter because I wept through every single verse. Uh, I, I fell in love with Jesus through the lens of Isaiah. Powerful. Well, in in terms of, you'd mentioned that you discovered a lot about Isaiah as as a prophet, as as a husband, as a father, you know, what he was doing in the kingdom across five different reigns, if you will. Uh, In terms of the time and the place and what we see happening, what were some of maybe the the context clues or, uh, you know, matter of fact, in the moment things that you were surprised about or uh, maybe were a little bit different than you understood them going in? Yeah, well, you know, we're, we're in a quarantine uh, still in some places in the United States and maybe around the world. And I was just shocked at how Isaiah is applicable, that, that every single chapter in Isaiah has an application to the church today. It is the fifth gospel. I call it the gospel of Isaiah because he preaches the good news, comfort, comfort my people. Isaiah is the one that speaks about, uh, you know, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the good news, quoted in Romans 10. But it's really Isaiah that penned those words. 
I, I think just seeing how his prophecies parallel the world today and speak to our world and to our needs and the need for peace. There's actually, uh, you know, years ago uh, when the Twin Towers fell in New York on 911, I was drawn to that verse in Isaiah that says, when the towers fell, I will open up springs of refreshing. And he, he mentions the towers falling. It's like, oh, Isaiah's prophecies are amazing. And now uh, in chapter 20, uh, in 20, is it chapter 20 or 26? He has a prophecy. He says, go into your room, your inner chamber, shut the door behind you and stay there. Wait for a little while until this quarantine is passed. I didn't use the word quarantine, but it's the word calamity. And it, it wait until this trauma is over. God is saying, go into your inner chamber, shut the door behind you, get rid of distractions, meet with me, wait with me until this is over. And you're going to come out of this a totally different person. So many hidden gems that are just under the surface, treasures of darkness. I will give to you the treasures of darkness, the prophecies he gave of Cyrus by name. Amazing. And uh, maybe you can tell I'm kind of crazy about the book of Isaiah. We have a study guide and a devotional, and I'm teaching a live course uh, every Thursday evening. I'm just overflowing with uh, that fifth gospel of Isaiah. And uh uh, related to kind of how you felt about the book of Isaiah before you entered into this project, if you will, um, were you as much in love with Isaiah starting out or is no. it, did you just discover it anew as you were going I, through the process? Yeah, I was intimidated by Isaiah. I mean, come on, 66 chapters. And then I realized there's 66 books in the Bible. And then I began to see the parallel between the first 39 chapters of Isaiah and the first 39 books of our Bible, the Old Testament. And then starting in chapter 40, he's, he's, he uses the words, comfort my people, prepare the way for the Lord. And John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, quotes from Isaiah 40. So the last part of Isaiah mirrors the New Testament in so many ways. So I went from intimidation to inspiration. I was, I was so like, oh, no, who, who can study? Who can get your arms around a book this big, this massive, daunting. A few scholars even tackle it because it's just, it's, uh, it'll, you'll spend your whole life studying it if you, if you really dive into that book. So, like I said, to go from like avoiding it somewhat, of course, I'd read it in my yearly Bible reading, going through the Bible, but, but I didn't really understand it until I, dove a deep dive into translating it. And uh, I'm in awe. I'm totally in awe. If you, anybody doubts the inspiration of scripture, you need to read the book of Isaiah. It'll shake you up in a good way. Well, and just like every book writing journey transforms an author, you can't emerge uh, on the other side of that without somehow being shifted or changed. So uh, related to you working through the book of Isaiah, uh, what's one thing you learned about God that maybe you hadn't seen before? And then also on the other side of that journey, how were you personally shifted or changed? Yeah, what I think I, I learned most about God is that, he, that mercy will always triumph. I knew the verse in James about mercy triumphs over judgment. I, I know that. But when I'm looking at all these prophecies over different nations, uh, you know, it, it can be intimidating. It can be a little bit frightening. And then, but at the end, God always has a remnant. Isaiah chapter four, he speaks about the remnant in Jerusalem that, that uh, will be cleansed with the spirit of fire and the, and, uh, the spirit of, of uh, justice. And, and this, this um, God ultimately shows mercy in the end truth is what aligned my heart with God in a new way, that premature judgments are always going to fall by the wayside. 
And mercy definitely is going to win in the end. I mean, come on, we know how the book ends. We know how the Bible ends. It's tears are wiped away, joy streaming from our spirit, from our hearts, an endless bliss, a return to the Edenic paradise of bliss and, and delight. So everything else is just stuff. So I think I saw that change in Isaiah himself, the first five chapters, he spoke six woes over everybody. Woe is you, woe this person, woe is realtors, those who add house to house. <laughs> woe to those that parade their sin and make it public. And it just, he spoke woe over everybody. And then in chapter six, he spoke woe over himself. And he experienced the Lord high and lifted up. And that in a, in a similar but not identical way, I experienced the mercy kiss of God in the book of Isaiah. And that was a surprise. Well, and Brian, I want to actually get back to something that we talked about in our first interview. And, and that's what you hope the readers discover about God's heart while, when they encounter any book in the Passion Translation. So in terms of the reader's experience, the journey with the Passion, passion Translation, what do you want every person to see about God? That he's passionate. That if he's angry, get out of the way. I mean, he's, he, his fury and his wrath is real. You cannot water it down. But in the same way, maybe more, is his love. Chesed is the Hebrew word. And it is a covenant, loyal love that can never be broken. It's, it's like God has to love you. He is who he is. Would, he wouldn't be who he is if he didn't love you. That passion of his heart. Uh, is what I think every reader of the Passion Translation and Isaiah specifically will walk away with, I hope, is to see the emotive qualities of God, that he is approachable, he is a father, a bridegroom. Uh, you know, he never calls himself mother, but he's described in feminine terms so many times in, a, in the book of Isaiah. And like a mother may forget her child, I will never forget you. You're engraved on the palms of my hand, he says. Like a mother, I, I could never forget my chesed, my racham, which is uh, mercy and compassion. But it's also the same word as womb. In God's womb, you are linked in the umbilical cord of love and his mercy, compassion, and love for you is so intense. The mountains could crumble, but his covenant of love would never be removed from you. Those are all truths in Isaiah. So I, I think what I'd want everybody uh, watching this and eventually, I hope, reading the Passion Translation and the book of Isaiah specifically, what I'd want everybody to discover is what I found, that God invented love, mercy, and compassion. He's the author. He's the God of comfort and mercy. And judgment may endure for a night. Weeping may happen in a season of our life, but joy will come in the morning. He will replace beauty, our ashes with beauty. And again, those verses are also linked to Isaiah. So if you take a, a micro or a macro view of the book of Isaiah, you'll realize how many New Testament concepts have, have emerged that were given birth from the book of Isaiah. Well, Brian, it's almost time for us to wrap up, but I would love if you would just take a few moments to pray for the people watching us, the people listening to us. Uh, what's the word of encouragement you have for them today? Well, hope endures we have an anchor for our soul. It's, it's an anchor that doesn't go down. It goes up. It is fastened to the mercy seat, Hebrews 6. We have an anchor for our souls. And in very uncertain times, I mean, we're, everything's so uncertain, uh, health issues, career, finances, political, all the issues that are like ransacking our culture, there is a hope, secure, steadfast within the veil for you. And I want to just pray for everybody right now to have a baptism of that hope, to have to cling to that anchor, no matter how difficult your day may be, that you have a security inside the veil. Jesus, our forerunner. Lord, we lay hold of you. We thank you, God, for giving us a Savior like Jesus, Yeshua, the beautiful Son, despised by the world, but loved and cherished 
by every lover and follower of him. Lord, thank you for the Savior, Jesus. Thank you for the hope you've given to us. We ask that that hope would grow on. It would be a living hope. It would bring us into the peace and spiritual people are steadfast stayed to the hope we have in Christ. Lord, thank you that you are the stability of our times. You are strength for every day, and you're the hope that endures forever. We love you, Lord. We thank you. Let blessing pour out now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that, Brian. And Brian, for the listeners who'd like to connect with you, find out more about the Passion Translation, where are some of the places we can do that on the web? Sure. Well, you could stop by our our ministry website, passionandfire.com. I jokingly say I'm passion. My wife is the fire. (laughs) Passionandfire.com. Easy way to remember. Or you can just do the Passion Translation, T-H-E, thepassiontranslation.com. And there's lots of FAQs that are answered there and all kinds of information about the translation itself. And then on Passion and Fire, you can, you can uh, connect to us. Well, like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Brian and pick up your very own copy of the Passion Translation. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Brian Simmons. Once again, our book today was the book of Isaiah, The Vision, which is part of the Passion Translation. For more on Brian and the Passion Translation, two places you can go. You can head on over to passionandfire.com, and you can also head on over to thepassiontranslation.com. And Brian, I, I want you to make some noise and hold those up, because I was talking, <laughs> so they're not going to see have seen those. Sh- show us the All book right. and the study guide. There is the book of Isaiah. Here's a 12-week study guide that is meaty, uh, 200 pages. It's just not fluff. And then we also have a devotional that we've written 365 days in the book of Isaiah called The Vision. And I will be sure to link to all of those resources in the show notes for the episode. You'll be able to find that over at SeanTabbitt.com. And Brian, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's truly been an honor and a joy to have you back in the show. You're amazing, Sean. I'm always blessed to be with you. Thanks, bro. 